Hi, this is Chauncey Winter of Power Curve Inc. and this is the second part of our first video about top-down design with Pro Engineer Wildfire 5. Um, now, the way I would often start, or actually I would have to say always start a new project, is that by thinking of what the engineering numbers are that are important to me. And so I'm going to do that in a Pro Engineer layout. So here's my project architect parameters. And when you're thinking about numbers in a, designing a project, there are CAD relevant parameters and parameters that are not CAD relevant, right? Um, and so as a project engineer or as a project architect using top-down design, I'm obviously interested in the CAD relevant parameters. Okay, so these really are the most important factors regardless of what kind of rocket I'm trying to develop around the world for whatever purpose I've actually captured it in a very short list here okay first of all what is the payload mass that is supposed to go into space because if I know the mass then someone can use the equations of motions to back out how much energy it's going to take to get that mass into space getting to a certain altitude at a certain velocity right that's all just energy equations and so what they're going to do is with that mass, um, someone is going to tell me, so in the propulsion group in this case, what the volume of fuel is required. Now, I'm not going to separate. Right now, there is another consideration we won't talk about, which is, well, how much of the boost should occur using the first stage and how much should we occur using the second stage. We're just going to skip that bit of detail because it's not important to top-down design in general. But the concept is that they're going to tell me how much fuel volume is required to provide the necessary energy. And then based on the fuel volume, someone can figure out what the oxidizer volume is. Okay, that stuff is not directly CAD relevant yet, right? I can have a tank. Obviously, I have to have tanks to hold that volume. But there's an infinite number of possible shapes that will meet a certain volume. So I need to narrow it down as the project architect. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, look, I'm going to create some parameters that are going to drive the diameters I want to use for my fuel tanks and my oxidizer tanks in the various stages. And then I will use behavioral modeler, and I won't do that in this session, but I use behavioral modeler to say, okay, if my tank diameter is going to be this and the volume I require is that, what does the length have to be? Okay. But the beauty is then analysis can say, whether I need a longer, slender, more slender vehicle, uh, or whether I should use a thicker, stouter, you know, um, higher diameter, stouter vehicle, um, I know those are changes that are going to occur. So I've captured those parameters right up front. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take this 120 inch diameter, which is the upper, the stage two, the upper stage, and we're going to bump it up to let's say, oh, what do we have down below? We got 155. So we'll bump, um, we'll bump it to 160, let's go 170 to make it really visible. And I'm going to take the stage 2 oxidizer and also bump it to 170. So this is just a table that makes my parameters printable into a drawing. Let's go to the actual parameter table itself to make those changes. So stage 2 diameter for fuel, we're going to make that 160, 160, and stage 2 diameter for the oxidizer, we're also going to make that 160, and OK. And as is typical in Pro, I need to regenerate or refresh that page for those new values to show, and here they show, and they can be printed out as new requirements to the rest of the team, for example. Okay, so now when I come back to the layout model, initially I haven't forced the regeneration, but my layout model, all my skeletons are declared to this layout. That gets confusing because Pro Engineer uses a layout as a type of file, which we were just looking at, versus I use the term layout here in a more conventional engineering sense where you're actually laying out the, the, the dimensions of your design. So right now we see how this next down, but I've just increased these from 120 to 160 
And we would like to see everything stay nicely connected together. So I'm going to do a regenerate. And we now see, it's very small it looks like, but it coned out a little bit. Uh, the, the interstage adapter has coned out to keep the stages married together and give a flow, uh, force a load path. And this is all much wider, and we see that the fairing has had to make its adjustments. Everything's worked exactly the way we want them to. Okay, So there's the type of changes you can make. Well, okay, this is a little pie in the sky right now, right? This is just with the skeleton models. The company hasn't, from this alone, the company hasn't, your, your company hasn't seen any um, productivity improvements. So you don't want to lose sight of the fact that for skeleton models and for top-down design to work, you need all your design teams to take advantage of those files. And that's what we're going to show now. Okay, we're going to go over to, actually I want to make one more dramatic change here because I really want the, the angle on this adapter to shift so that we see, you know, so some more visible changes in the, uh, in the production models. So that particular thing is an interstage adapter. So I'm going to activate that right now. I will change my filter to features and then I'll modify that particular skeleton and we'll change this to say it needs to be much stouter since we're carrying much more weight now and so perhaps we can only go to 30 degrees and again I'll do a regenerate Aha! We did see the expected change on here, but it looks like our fairing came apart. That's not acceptable, is it? And what I need to do is activate the assembly again, and then let me regenerate the assembly one more time to allow the changes to ripple down through this. Now that doesn't quite work, and I can't actually explain the reason why, but I'm going to activate the payload fairing and regenerate it. You know, I'm quite sure that will then work. There you go. So that now is reconnected the way we needed it to. Okay, so enough of the hocus pocus with the, the top-down models, but I hope you'll agree we've made very dramatic changes. This is a real rocket skeleton. This thing is 20 stories high, and there would be dozens of people working in every area from propulsion to avionics to structures. And if they are trained to use top-down skeletons, Okay, they're going to see some dramatic changes done automatically for the company. Now, this is the this is the gotcha. This is where companies fall down is that they do not uh, have, there's not a management culture set up that requires engineers to use these skeletons properly, and that gives them the one or two days of training necessarily necessary to do so. But the advantages would be enormous if they would if they would put their engineers through that training and require them to use these skeletons. As then we're going to see that in just a moment. So let's go to the actual production models now. And we'll go to that same familiar front view. Okay. And things look kind of disconnected here. The fairing's not the right location, but it looks like it's maybe the right size. Uh, that's actually looking pretty good right in there. Well, the reason this is still discombobulated is because, and let's pull the model tree over, is the skeletons, I have not regenerated this production model yet. All the skeletons are distributed at various locations throughout the, the family tree to wherever they need to be, okay? But I've not given them an opportunity to readjust in the context of this assembly. So I need to do a quick regenerate here. And notice the change we're going to see in that shape change. Notice how dramatic that change was right there. Okay. Now imagine that happening on every tank, interstage adapter, engine mount, you name it, across the project. The advantages that would be um, would occur to your productivity. I'm going to go ahead and pull up that particular stage, the, the, the production model just to show you that this is a real 
familiar CAD parts, not just skeletons. And this might be a good time to go to a shaded view and turn off some of the skeletons that are driving all of this and shade. So these are all production parts. If I go to a cross-section view, now you can see that this is a little bit more than, uh, than simple skeleton models. So that, in a nutshell, is what you're striving for in top-down design. Um, I think an important point, since everyone, these demos have been out there for 20 years, an important point is people have a tendency to go, oh, well, that's just the demo. They knew what they were going to change, you know, so it's hocus-pocus. And, of course, it is easier when you know exactly what you're going to change. There's no question about that. But the more important point is that nothing's faked. Capturing these types of changes automatically and having them ripple down through your design, it is not magic. It just takes training your people on how to use modern day tools properly, not at a low level of just producing drawing views. They actually need to know how to tie their geometry to, to the requirements placed or, or represented by skeletons so that when changes occur, their geometry can update accordingly. So to finish up, um, thank you for watching this video. This is, again, just the first in a series of videos. The other free tutorials are all available at powercurve.org, and they address the actual details of accomplishing what you saw here uh, during this session. I hope you enjoyed your time.